itself. I'm so happy to offer this testimony. And the testimony I offer is seeing the history of Islam goes back so far, it puts us to shame. Everybody thought we were the ones that started the university. We were the ones, the first ones who gave women the right. We, we were, it was us, it was us, and it wasn't. And I think the thing that I carry away and uh, that is so important is building bridges. There is nothing you said that I cannot relate to. And Dr. Sabil had given many outreach presentations and workshops in various cities in the United States of America on the topics of Sharia, which is Islamic law, freedom of speech, comparative religion, and youth empowerment. Dr. Ahmed Sabil, Sabil Ahmed. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I start in the name of God, the most beneficent and the most merciful, and welcome and greet all of you with the Islamic greeting of Assalamu Alaikum. Do any one of you know what that means, that greeting? That means, may God's peace be upon you. So you may be wondering from your New Testament that when Jesus, when he met his disciples at the upper chamber, the very first thing that he mentioned to them was the greeting of peace. He said, peace be upon you. So right away you can appreciate the commonalities that we have. Yes, we believe, admire and we respect Jesus, peace be upon him. A Muslim cannot be a Muslim if we don't believe in Jesus as a prophet, not as God, not as son of God, but as a mighty prophet. You know, looking at all of you and being amongst your mates reminds me of my time in India. So I was born and raised in India. So as I was growing up in India, I used to watch many, many Hollywood movies. And my only impression of America and Americans is what they used to show in the media. They used to show in the media that Americans, they all carry weapons. <laughs> they go out in the morning and they shoot each other out, right? That's the only impression I had. So when I came to the USA, I was very fearful of every white person, black person which I met. I used to look over my shoulder to see, is that person coming after me? However, coming here, settling down here with my parents, going to school over here, obviously my misconceptions, my fears, they went away because now I got to see my fellow Americans. Now I got to meet my brothers and sisters in this country and many, many walls that were there in between the Muslims and my Christians and the Jewish and the Hindus over here, they went away. And that is because I got to meet and speak and smile and shake hands with each other. So I hope and pray that when we are invited over here, myself and uh, Imam Charles, let's hope and pray that the same thing may happen. You may, I may have maybe some walls. We may have some misconceptions. Hopefully by this presentation, by this educational interaction that we will have, hopefully they will go away. Once the, those misconceptions goes away, now we can look at each other as brothers, as sisters, as part of the big humanity that our creator has created all of us. We have more things in common than we have differences. So hopefully we can come on that common platform and work to make humanity better and that's the purpose we are here. So with that being said, I have a short presentation that goes over the Muslims in the USA and what do we believe. So just with the raise of hands, how many of you may have heard or read about Islam and Muslims? I know you did. <laughs> you came in the last time. <laughs> Welcome back. Who else? Have you read any book about Islam, about Muslims? Any one of you? Many, many, many years ago perhaps when you were going to schools, colleges, right? <laughs> Maybe recently. Just one, one brother in the back. What book have you read? Part of the Quran. Oh, you did? Okay, wonderful. So, what I d usually do is, I start off with a quiz. All right, so here is my quiz. All of you can see that photo, right? What is that skyline up there? Do you recall any one of the buildings in that? Oh, Sears Tower residential building. There you go, you have Sears. So, I was driving with my family, so I have three kids. I was driving with my family and I showed them this photo as I was driving and I asked them the question, you know those two big structures that you see on either side, 
what do you think they, they are? What do you think the commonalities between them? What do you think if I ask you the same question? So one is the Sears Tower, which is on the right, the Willis Tower, right? On the right side and the left side you have the John Hancock building. So what do you think is the commonality between those two buildings? I mean, they are tall, they are black, right? <laughs> Besides that, what do you think? A lot of people work there. Okay. Yes, of course, <laughs> a lot of people work there. People go up there to see like, you know, the, the lake shore and the rest of the Chicago, five miles, you know, all around. What else? Offices, many offices. Okay, many offices, there you go. Imam Charles, what do you say? Uh, skyscrapers, tall buildings. Tall buildings, okay. They're, they're both there, they're still there. Yes, the yes, they are there, yes. Broadcasting. Okay, fine, all those answers are true, what I'm looking at, because we are in the context of Islam and Muslims in the USA. Both of the structures would not be there if not they were the main structural engineer for both the buildings was a Muslim structural engineer. Yes, by the name of Dr. Fazlur Rahman, anyone who have been to the Sears Tower, as you come down towards the exit, you will find his sculpture there. It says Dr. Fazlur Rahman in the year 1973. Similarly, many, many cities in the USA, their downtowns may not be the same if not for that person. So he's called as the Einstein of structural engineering. Dr. Fazlur Rahman, you know, those who are taking notes up there. Maybe I, I can have a quiz at the end of the presentation. <laughs> so he was an immigrant, came like way back in the 50s or the 60s and then that was the contribution that he made. Anyone heard about the Rumi? Yeah. Yeah? Yes. Even right now if you go to Amazon.com, the best selling poet right now in the 21st century is none other than a Muslim poet by the name of Rumi in the USA. I mean obviously he died more than eight centuries ago. But still the impact that he's having in the Western culture, even in the 21st century, yes, a Muslim. You know, each year they come up with the top names for the boys and for the girls, for the babies, right? They do. So in the top 10 list, lo and behold, one of the names, the top name in the USA, in the top 10, is none other than the name Muhammad. Yes. Actually, people say that this is the most common name in the whole world. Actually, in the UK, I was listening uh, last time, they said that the top name in the USA is the name Muhammad. Top, top first name. Yeah, not only just in the top 10, but the number one name in the UK is the name Muhammad. Yes. You know, just as a, just as a footnote to that, how many of you are from the Jewish background? Yeah. Okay, yourself. So here is a fact for you, right? There are more Muslims by the name of the Jewish prophets than all the Jews in the world combined. Isn't that something? There are more Muslims in the whole world with the names of the prophets of the Old Testament than all the Jews in the world combined. So actually I have two sons. 7th grade and 2nd uh, grade, right? They grow up so fast, <laughs> I have to see what grade they are. My youngest one, his name is Joseph, Yusuf. And my oldest one, Abraham for Ibrahim. So that shows again, the love, the respect, the connection, the commonality that we have with our Jewish brothers and sisters and our Christian brothers and sisters. Okay, what do you think is common between these three rulers? Let me just give you some hint, all right? <laughs> you may not be able to see who they are just by the photo. Just by looking at that, what do you think they have in common in the context of the presentation, in the context of the history of the USA? They're all Muslims? Uh, one of them is not Muslim. Okay, two of them are Muslim, but what do you think they may have done in the history of the USA? Any hint? What if I told you it had to do with, you have a... They established uh, diplomatic relations? Yes, yes. Okay, fine. I think you, you are getting to it. So the first country in the whole world that recognized the independence of the USA was none other than the Muslim country of Morocco. No kidding. Yes. Not France, not Germany, not UK, right? 
None of them but a Muslim country came and supported the young USA where it needed the support. The third country in the whole world was none other than the country that used to be a region called Mysore. Right now it is part of India. It used to be an independent state. So that became the number third country in the whole world to recognize United States of America. So the point I am trying to make from the very beginning, even before Columbus, there were Muslim presence over here, Muslim impact over here and that has been continuous even to our time. All right, what do you think is common between all of these wars? Just taking a guess, there are Muslim soldiers in every war. There you go, you are getting it. <laughs> Very good. All right. The there you go, right? I mean, in, in every question, there may be something about Muslims, <laughs> correct? Yes, you are right. Way back from the very first war, which, which is a revolutionary war, there have been many, many Muslims who fought on the side of Washington and they sacrificed with their wealth, with their person, with their time, with their effort and yes, with their lives. There were no less than 300 Muslims in the civil war. They fought on the side of Abraham Lincoln for the unity of our country and the rest of the wars as you may have seen. So yes, Bampet Muhammad was one of those individuals and Alexander Webb, he was a convert to Islam in the late uh, 1800s and now the US appointed him as an ambassador to the Philippines. So again this shows the impact that Muslims are having way back many many centuries. Right now he is a top neurologist in Northwestern. As a Muslim he is making an impact in that very important field. There are close to 35,000 to 50,000 Muslim physicians in the USA. So not only they are living here. We have 100 plus free clinics in the USA for those people who are uninsured or underinsured. So again, just this shows that Muslims as part of our faith, we are supposed to be helping our people of the country and humanity and definitely our neighbors. And they are doing that as physicians. And these are some of the impact in the field of sports and you know Hollywood and politics. You know, Karim Abdul Jabbar, he he had the most number of points in all of the NBA, in the NBA history. So how many of you watch basketball? Yeah, which is your favorite team like right now as they're playing? Uh, LA Lakers, Celtics, Nets, Bulls. Bulls? Okay, I hope they win. <laughs> they have a really s slim chance. <laughs> uh, who is this person? Muhammad Ali, right? Yes, obviously, right? So he was a Muslim and uh, he is called as the greatest boxer. He did a lot of work for activism, right? For rights and whatnot. And there are many Muslims who are having impact in different ways. Uh, in, in, in Hollywood, there have been many Muslims who, who have been having an impact. Shaquille O'Neal as an NBA. Who is this person? Dr. Oz. In the past, Dave Chappelle. Uh, Nobel Prize winners, yes, there have been many, many Muslim Nobel Prize winners from the Ibtihaj Muhammad, he became, she became the very first lady, Muslim lady wearing the hijab, taking part in the Olympics. She was the 2014 world champion and in the last Olympics she won the bronze medal as a Muslim lady wearing the hijab. So when people, when they have misconceptions, you know, Muslim ladies cannot do that, they have to stay home, they cannot go outside. This is an example that she was empowered by Islam with properly modestly dressing and then she became a world champion. And there have been many Muslims in the US Armed Forces, the very first, uh, uh, the very first congressman, Muslim congressman in the USA is none other than Keith Allison from, from Minnesota. Some of you watch YouTube, I guess, yes, YouTube videos. So one of the founders of YouTube was none other than a Muslim by the name of Javed Karim. So what is Islam? What are the basics of Islam? So the basics of Islam is we believe in a creator who we say in Arabic, his name is Allah. Have you heard the name Allah before? Yes, yes you did. So when we say the word Allah, we are not worshipping a different God. The same creator in different languages, we have different names. Just like the, you see the names over here. In Hebrew language, in the Old Testament language, the name for God is Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim. 
In the language of Jesus, the name of God is Ilah, Allah. What do you think was his language? Not Arabic, but Aramaic. Yes, language. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, the name for God in that language is Allah, very close to the word Allah. And then the rest of the languages, right? So all of these languages, they are referring to the same God in a different language. That does not mean they are worshipping a different God, same God. Allah is the same God. We say that Moses used to worship Abraham and the, all the prophets. Alright, so these are the languages and those are the names for gods in those languages. So we say that God has many, many attributes. We say he's only one in one. Not multiple persons, multiple idols or multiple entities. We say God is the creator and the rest is the creation. He's a loving God. He's a merciful, forgiving God. He's independent, he's powerful, all-knowing. And we say that for the love of humanity, God wants to guide humanity. So to guide humanity, God appointed messengers and prophets, the names which I mentioned to you. So this is one more quiz question to all of you. None of you have phones, right, to look up the answers, hopefully not, <laughs> right? <laughs> Who do you think is the most mentioned prophet by name in the whole Quran? Not Brother Charles, you know the answer, okay. <laughs> and a hint, all right, a hint for you especially. He is the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. Mohammed. Of the Old Testament. The Old Testament. Starts with the letter M, you are getting it. Moses. Moses, yes, of course, right. Moses, peace be upon him. So Moses is the most mentioned prophet also in the Quran by name. Not Muhammad, peace be upon him, not any other prophet. That shows, again, the commonalities that we have with each other. So we say that all of the prophets and the messengers, God gave one consistent message. And that consistent message was, that do not worship humans and idols and creation, but only submit to the one creator. So when God, when he created Adam as the very first man, so the story of Adam and Eve is also there in the Quran. However, there's a slight difference between the story of Adam and Eve in the Bible compared to the Quran. In the Bible, it says that both of them were created, but then the first sin was committed, correct? According to the Bible. So who committed the very first sin according to the Bible? Adam. No, not Adam, Eve. <laughs> Eve, right? However, the Quran says that the very first sin was committed not by Eve, but both of them together. So I always say that equality in Islam starts from day one, <laughs> right? <laughs> Why not? So when Adam and Eve, when they were placed on earth, they both asked God for forgiveness. That, oh God, please forgive us, we committed the sin. And it says in the Quran, God forgave them. So we believe that the sin is not passed from them to the rest of the progeny. They committed the sin, they asked for forgiveness and God forgave them. End of story. So we don't believe in original sin, we believe in original goodness. That every child, every baby is born with a pure heart and pure mind. Only after they reach the age of puberty, as they make the choices, that's when they would be held accountable. But as a child, as a baby, as a newborn baby, they are sinless, pure and innocent. Then it says that as humanity was increasing all over the world, then God gave them the commandment to all the prophets. It says in the Quran, chapter 16, verse number 36, that God appointed messengers and prophets to all the nations of the past with one singular commandment, right? Chapter 16, verse number 36. And that commandment was, invite your people to the submission of one God. So that submission to one God in Arabic is Islam. So if someone asks you the question, what is Islam? You have heard the presentation, you can say to them, Islam is an Arabic word that means submission to the one God, one creator. So submission means knowing who he is, following his guidance, sharing his guidance, transforming our lives, making humanity better by applying the guidance. All of them means, all of them combined together means we are submitting to the one creator. So a quiz question for all of you. What is the name of those people who follow Islam? What is the name of the followers of Islam? 
There you go. Yeah, that was an easy one, right? Yes. You know, just like you have Christians and Christianity, Buddhist and Buddhism, in the same way we have Islam as the name of the faith and the followers are called as Muslims. So according to the Quran, all of the, pro all of the prophets, they followed the one same ideology, the ideology of submission to one God. So according to Islam, we say that every prophet was a Muslim. Even Jesus, Moses, Abraham, all the prophets that you see here and many more prophets in the Quran. And we say that the last prophet was none other than Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So maybe in the Q&A session we can go over some questions that may be coming to their mind based upon what I just mentioned. So these are the names of some of the prophets who are mentioned in the Quran. I'm very close to wrapping up. So as you can see, you have the biblical names and you have the Arabic names. So my son's name is Abraham, right over here. So in Arabic, we say Ibrahim. In the Arabic Quran, the one that you read was English, obviously, right? But if you go to the original Arabic Quran, it says the word Ibrahim. My other son's name is Yusuf. There you go, right there. So Joseph is the biblical name, but Yusuf is the Arabic name. And then you can see the rest of the names. So these are the six beliefs in Islam. We believe in the absolute oneness of God. We believe in the angels. We believe in all the prophets from the very first man, Adam was the first prophet and Muhammad peace be upon him was the last prophet. We believe in the divine books that were given to the prophets of the past. We say that Jesus received a book, a revelation from God. Moses did, so did David, so did Abraham. We as Muslims have to believe in all of those books in their original forms. However, the last book that God has sent for humanity's guidance we say is the Quran itself. So one important fact about the Quran, right? An amazing fact about the Quran. There are no less than 15 million people in the whole world who memorize the whole book of the Quran. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Right? If I ask you the question, how many of uh, you when you were going to schools and colleges, like memorize, you know, 10 pages of your biology book, for example, it would be hard. So my son, second grader, he knows uh, like 35, 40 chapters of the whole Quran in the Arabic language. Wow. He can stand over here, looking, not looking at any book, closing his eyes, he can recall all the 40 plus chapters of the Quran. Wow. So that's one of the miracles and that's one of, that God has mentioned in the Quran. In chapter 15, verse number 9, it says, Inna nahnu nazzalna zikra wa inna lahu la hafizun. Right? Arabic. The English translation is, it is God who has sent down this message and he will preserve it. So we say, since no new book is to come, God is preserving the last guidance. So it can be a source of solutions for humanity's problems. Then we believe that there would be a day of judgment. Every single human is going to pass away one day. Only God knows the time, the place uh, and, and the occasion. But when we pass away, according to Islam, it's not the end of our lives. God is going to bring us back to life according to, according to the Quran. And we will be standing in front of God and God would be testing. God would be taking us into account, judging us. How did you, le how did you live your life? What faith did you follow? What belief did you follow? What practices that you did? You know, just like we have evaluation in our schools and colleges when we were young. This is the grand evaluation according to Islam on the day of judgment. Every single human has to pass through this. So the criteria in Islam of going to paradise is two. According to the Quran, chapter 2, verse number 25. If a person has the right belief and doing good deeds, the Quran says, God promises those people eternal paradise. Means believing in the, in the creator and all the beliefs and good deeds that God has mentioned, we strive to be the best. Anytime that we fall short, then we have to pray to God for forgiveness directly, right? No mediator, direct forgiveness. And just like in schools and colleges, there is always a, you know, a, a failing grade for some people. If they don't come to class, take the quizzes, do the assignments, in the same way, we also believe in the hellfire. But we pray that may Allah protect us away from the hellfire and make all of us believing in the Creator and going to paradise. Ameen. 
and I am going to end with this that by good actions a Muslim is supposed to transform their lives, their families and the society. So the very first pillar that we have is to recite the testimony of faith. In, 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 in Arabic is, it goes like this. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. That means I testify that there is no other God besides one God Allah and I testify that Muhammad is the slave servant of Allah. So if a person has to convert to Islam, there have been many people of their own choice, right? No compulsion on their own choice. They say they come to the mosque or give us a call and they say, you know what, I have been studying Islam. I believe this is the truth. How do I become a Muslim? So we go over with that person, the basics of Islam and then the person recites the Shahada, the testimony of faith. The second pillar is to pray five times a day. Some of you may have seen on the YouTube or some place how Muslims pray. So we pray at least five times a day. Then giving charity at least 2.5% of our saved assets we give to the poor, the needy and the helpless. And fasting in the month of Ramadan, do you, any one of you recall what is the name of that month in which we fast? It starts with the letter R. There you go, Ramadan, yes. It is coming in less than a month. In less than a month, from dawn all the way to sunset, about maybe 14 to 16 hours, a Muslim is supposed to stay away from food and drink and intimacy with their spouses and stay away from any evil thing that we may have been doing that we are not supposed to be doing. At least for one month. So it should become a habit for us to stay away from the wrong things and inculcate the good things that brings us close to God, hopefully humongous reward. And the last important pillar that we have, then I will end with this, at once in a lifetime we are supposed to go for pilgrimage. Where do you think we go to? Mecca. Mecca, there you go, Mecca, right? I have been there 2012, about eight years ago, humongous experience. Just imagine all of Chicago coming together in one place, like 3.5 million people, different races, different backgrounds, different languages, right? All of them coming together as human family, worshipping together, the same creator. It gives us the sense that at the end of the day, there should not be any barriers. We are all humans. We are all flesh and blood. We are all brothers and sisters. So let me end with this important passage from the Quran. This is in chapter 49 of the Quran, verse number 13. Chapter 49, verse number 13. God is addressing all of us and God is saying, so I'll I will just give the translation. So God is speaking and he's saying that, O oh mankind, O oh humanity, I have created you from one single male and one single female and made you into nations and peoples and tribes that you get to know each other. Not that you may hate and despite each other, you get to know each other. Then God says that the best amongst you is the one who is a God-fearing, well-mannered person. So I hope and pray that all of us as brothers and sisters, yes, we have differences, we have more things in common. That inshallah, God willing, as we say, we come together, worshipping the creator, following God's guidance. Inshallah, God willing, we can eradicate many, many ills and evils and problems in the world and we can establish societies which are going to be wholesome, moral, unified, just and the outcome would be peace. May God help us all. Thank you very much. Thank you. What I'm saying here, we fought battles uh, between men and women and who has the right to own property or to vote. And you see here, is that because of religion or is that because of society? And you brought up about this. <coughs> people being Muslim and they're in, in uh, being doctors, being in the Olympics. Now you showed some that were women. How big the struggle was that for women to all of a sudden come out in the Muslim world and voice their concern, their opinion, become who they are? Some countries are still suppressing it. 
this country is a little more open into it because we've been fighting this all along. And you start to see other countries doing it. Now, is that because of the society or is that because of the Muslim religion? If I could start, and maybe Dr. Spill would have something to add. That's right, an excellent yeah. question. If uh, I could start by saying that basically you kind of set up the question very nicely because it is a distinction between one or the other and culture and attitudes has everything to do with some of that struggle that you brought out. And that is to say that in the beginning, in the time of Muhammad, prayers and peace be on him, his first convert in, was his wife, Khadija, Lady Khadija. She actually was his boss. He was a merchant, he worked for her. And women from the beginning in the Islamic tradition were property owners. They had full rights. So when you see what is considered the oppression or the suppression of the women, that's cultural. It's not part of the religion. Modesty is the key. Men are all supposed to be modest. But the emphasis is put on the female for many reasons in terms of protection, but sometimes people go overboard. So I'll just put it like that. People go overboard sometimes in terms of what is supposed to be a good thing and make it so that they keep the women in the background. That's not Islam. They are very prominent. We just had a program uh, for the last couple of Sundays for Women's History Month showing the prominence of women in leadership in business, women in leadership in the mosque, and the next one is going to be this Sunday on women in leadership in nonprofit organizations. So women have a great role, and to your point, a lot of this stuff is baggage, cultural baggage, that is not the religion per se. Okay, yeah, alhamdulillah, that's very good. Uh, Do you have another question? Yeah, so let me just quickly also, you know, elaborate a bit more on what Imam Charles has mentioned. It's important for us to have a demarcation between what is culture and what is the actual teachings of Islam. It's really important. What the media does is, they highlight the culture, so it gives the impression that this is what Islam teaches. This is so important for us. Before Islam came to Arabia in the 7th century, women did not have the rights that we have right now. They were treated as property, they were discarded, they don't have any voice, no identity, they were treated as property. With the commandments of God coming in the Quran and through the person of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, Islam elevated women equal to men in the eyes of God. As Imam Charles has mentioned, in our country we won the right to vote in which year? 19... Women should know this, right? 1920, right? Islam gave them, women, the right to have a say in the political process way back in the 7th century. I'm saying Islam. Not the Muslim countries, not the culture, not the dictators, not the oppressors, but Islam. Secondly, in the state of Illinois, we won the right to, to owe the, pro the women won the right to owe property. Not all the women, but the married women. In the year 1861, Islam gave them the right to the Muslim women way back in the 7th century. What was it followed through? It was, yes, as the Imam has mentioned, the very first wife of Muhammad, peace be upon him. She was the CEO of a company, owing property, running a business, having many employees, CEO. Third example I can give. In this country, not until the year 1844, women had the right to keep their maiden name once they get married. Islam gave them the right way back in the 7th. So when I got married, the Cook County clerk, he asked my wife, so what should we change your last name to? She looked at angrily at him and said, why would you like to change my name, right? Change his name, right? <laughs> rights Islam has given. In this country, not until the late 17 to early 1800s, a, women won the right to attend universities and get PhDs. When we were struggling in this country, Muslim women way back in the year 859, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, the very oldest institution, oldest university in the whole world continues, it was made by a Muslim lady. So when we were struggling in the last 200 years or so, 
for give, given the right to vote, the right to own property, the right to have maiden name, the right to go to the higher education, it were the Muslim ladies who were making hospitals, pharmacies, and yes, universities. Uh, I have one question I want to ask today. Is the Taliban and the terrorism an expression of Islamic faith? Uh, in our media, mass media, and the imagery we have, is that there's an intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. Could you clarify that for us? That's an excellent question. I'm glad that you asked the question because that may be in the mind of some of you. The quick answer, absolutely not. Islam is perfect, Islam is just, Islam is peaceful. However, however, really important. You know, just like we have in the history of the Christian followers, we have the Crusaders, the Spanish Inquisition, the slave traders, the genocide of, na of the Native Americans in the name of Christianity. Some extreme Hindus are doing some nasty things in the name of Hinduism, oppressing the Muslims there. Buddhists are doing something similar, right? Jewish people, some of extremists. We say that we should not judge any faith by those people who are going not obeying their faith, but we should follow or we should look into what the teachings of their faith looking into the scriptures. Second important point is this, that the word terrorism, we should not only restrict to some people who are doing it from the followers of Islam. Terrorism is any act that can be done of a person of any faith or no faith. Islam does not have a monopoly on it, right? Muslims don't have a monopoly on it. When it comes to terrorism, every single act, I would say that every gun shooting in the USA, and there have been 406,000 killings in the USA by gun violence. And I say that every single act of them was terrorism. Even that shooting that happened two days ago, uh, by that uh, Caucasian young person in which eight Asian Americans, they were slaughtered. When I looked at it right away, I was crying, praying to God and I said, this is an act of terrorism. So terrorism is not restrict to, restricted to only what Muslims do. Some Muslims, any act done by any person, we should label as, as terrorism and equally we should all condemn it. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that yes, Islam condemns it. There is no passage in the Quran that incites a person. Actually, there are thousands, hundreds of passages that wants to bring humanity together. Actually, there is one passage, then you can take this. Chapter number 5 of the Quran, verse number 32 says, you know, God is speaking to humanity. God is saying that saving one innocent life it's like saving the life of all of humanity and taking one life is like taking the life of all of humanity. So that's how precious life is in the eyes of God. It's not just the life of a Muslim. The Quran says any life, any innocent person is equal as if we have slaughtered all of humanity. So we hope and pray that all of us working together by obeying God, we can defeat terrorism and violence and extremism. Doesn't matter with what cause, with what weapons, with what religion people are using it, all of them are equally wrong. We should equally condemn it. I just want to say quickly, uh, Dick, and Rittner, that was a great question. But I wanted to share something that I'm sure all of you can relate to, as well as myself. And that is, you would not identify the acts of the terrorist Ku Klux Klan who used yeah. the cross and Christianity as their symbol. With, uh, with the that is helpful. Thank you very yeah. much. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to conclude this now, and I'm sure you're available for a few minutes. For yes, a yes, we are. We are going to be here. Yes. Let's thank them for this very interesting conversation. Thank you. And thanks for inviting us. We are so honored. Any time that you need us, we'll be back. Different topics. You know, there are so many topics. It will be honor for us to meet with our, with our brothers and sisters in this wonderful place. Thank you. Can I just say one thing? A, a friend of mine who is a Jew in Aurora, the whole temple was decimated. They had graffiti all over the temple, oh, wow. racist, all kinds of slander. The Islamic community was the first church, the first parish that came to help them clean it up. They, they are doing what they say they do. Thank you. Yeah, that was an important practicing of the faith. Yes. Nice job. <clears throat>
ally and a peace giver. I was just saying to Dick, the wonderful slogan, you said, culture has oppressed us, but God has blessed us. And I think that's true of women. Women's been, you know, so many oppressed for one thing or another, but in the end, God is the one who blessed us. You did a wonderful job. So, good. Yeah. so since all of you are here, can I take like a small brief testimonial from you? Yes. Because we want to do this in many places, yes. you know, many churches, synagogues, because at the end of the day, education is so empowering. Because many misconceptions that you may have had about women especially, yes. right, may have at least gone away to some extent. When misconceptions go away, we come closer, yeah. right? So what, you, what do you think? Uh, the importance of us coming together and what you may have learned, maybe we can start with you quickly. Well, my, my thought was what you talked about, the terrorists, that, I'm sorry, but that's, I've always heard it was all Muslims. And I've learned from you that it, it's not. Just like you, you gave such a great example of the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. To me, that was so powerful, because you're not judging us by the burning of the cross. So to me, that was fantastic. Yes, if I want to know what Christianity is, I'm not going to look at KKK, I will read the Bible. Uh -huh. right? I will look into it with an open eyes, open heart, and then see what it is all about. But right? hearing it from you <laughs> was much better, much more powerful than reading it. Because I've read other things that aren't true. Okay, gotcha. No, thanks a lot. That means a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, again, yeah, yourself. I'm so happy to offer this testimony. And the testimony I offer is seeing the history of Islam goes back so far, it puts us to shame. Everybody thought we were the ones that started the university. We were the ones, the first ones who gave women the right. We, we were, it was us, it was us, and it wasn't. And I think the thing that I carry away and, uh, that is so important is building bridges. There is nothing you mm -hmm. said that I cannot relate to and translate it as a metaphor in my own religion. And I love what you said, culture oppressed us. And then you said, God has blessed us. I changed it to God, to my, my religion, and that's true. Yes. And I was just saying to my fellow woman here that the culture has oppressed women, but God has blessed us in that. The culture has oppressed black people and the Indians and, and the Muslims. There's always a cultural factor in oppression, but in the end to look to our God of our understanding. So I'm just really delighted that you were able to be here and, and share your what it really means to be a Muslim. And it's, it's mm -hmm. a, it is a blessing mm -hmm. to be part of the, of the family of God. It's an honor, you know, it's always an honor and you have interacted with us, you know, this is the second time. And you're carrying a bag, and we see the bag, yeah? There you go. Uh, yeah, it's one of my treasures. And it had what in there? It had the Quran, and then it had various pamphlets. The pamphlets I gave away, and the Quran, I work in a hospital, and they keep it there, because Muslim, Christian patients always have their Bible, yes. but Muslims never had a Quran, so now we have a Quran that we are able to share, lend, we, we don't give it away, we lend it to our patients who are there. And if you obviously, if you want more copies, we can always supply, as we have committed to supply some bags like this to the rest of the brothers, sisters who are here. We can do the same for the patients if they need more. If they so, need yeah, if, of course. So, again, thanks a lot, Alif.